Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining me for today's Cichlids and Coffee live stream. And I hope you're having a cup of joe, as we call it here in the States. For those of you outside the United States, we call it joe and uh, brew and I guess a few other nicknames. And uh, this is the official Cichlids and Coffee cup. Boy, that's good coffee. So I hope you're all doing well. I had a, a very uh, interesting week, as some of you are aware of, for those of you who saw my, um, my video. And I just want to thank all of you uh, who reached out and uh, gave me some, uh, some, positive, some positive support in what was obviously, if you watched the video, a, um, a somewhat difficult week. So uh, thank you, folks. Appreciate that very much. And Rico Stan came in with a $5 super chat right off the bat. I am going to be at the Rico Stan channel this Tuesday at uh, 530 Central, 630 Eastern. And uh, tune in, and I'll be doing an interview with Rico Stan. So uh, check that out. And uh, quick shout out to uh, moderators. Thank you, moderators, who help out on a volunteer basis. I think GP is in here. And I'm pretty sure Danny's going to show up. And uh, I believe Candy is still in the middle of her move. So um, we might not see her. And I noticed that Shane Cowger, Shane Cowger, am I pronouncing that, Shane? Are you still here? You were first on the chat. Be sure to uh, send me your mailing address. I'll get you out some of these great stickers I've got here. and. Uh, for those of you who don't know or have them, this is the uh, the Vinny design that you see over my shoulder on the uh, on the light, and of course the cichlids and coffee sticker, and also the one I have on my uh, on my shirt, which is a new design. The back of the shirt, I'll show it to you. Tell me what you think. The back is. Uh, Did you see that? I can't tell. But uh, anyway, it's a fluid situation. Fish keeping is a fluid situation. So um, at any rate, I have a lot, a lot to unpack today. I have a lot of tips on setting up a brand new aquarium or redoing a new one. It'll work really with either one. And also, uh, I have a, uh, some bonus tips for you. And I'm going to be sharing with you. And I also have a um, an announcement, an announcement that I think uh, you're going to like. I think you're going to like this announcement. So um, let's get some more folks in here. Hey, Sam Baldwin and Ivan. Hello, Ivan. Good morning to you and good morning to Gary. Brinny. Hey, R. Baglio. Good to see you, my friend. Tropical Fish Tanks and a Collie. Hello. How are you doing? And... Um, John Wallace. Hello, John Wallace. Misfit Reptiles and Aquatics. Love that name. Hello. And uh, let's see who else is in the house. Charles Super. Thank Hello, Charles. And yes, uh, that wasn't easy. Elijah Davis. Hello, Elijah. A big supporter of the channel. Thank you for showing up. GP. GP in the house. Senkil Kumar, who likes Iceberg. You know, my favorite cichlid is the one that's behaving. That's <laughs> the, one that's, the one that's not beating up the other tank mates is my favorite cichlid. Uh, actually, I have so many favorites. I don't know where I would start, actually. Z-Zip. I look at your name, Z-Zip. I think of ZZ Top, one of my favorite bands. Hey, Shannon King. Alphonse is here. Evolution R8. Pramud AS. Hello, Pramud. And... Um, I hope you're safe as well. Tennessee is uh, lifting mask requirements. It's up to individual stores as to want, whether they want to go with that or not. But it is signs of progress and signs of returning to uh, normalcy. I, you know, I love going out and filming uh, fish stores and uh, walking around. And it's a little bit difficult when you've got that mask on and 
you know, it, it, for me anyway, it's a little bit hard to breathe and I can really tell the difference when I pull it down. It's like, Oh my goodness. That it's like your body. It's like your body reacts. Pause. So it's, it's going to be nice to finally go back to, or be able to go back to, um, how things were. So, um, Fishaholic, Olympia, Washington. Hey, Fishaholic, you've been waiting for an hour. I'm sorry, my friend. Uh, yeah, we've been on 11 a.m. Central Time for a while, only because starting at 10 a.m. was, uh, you know, Pacific Time was a little bit early for the folks out West. So I kind of did it for you. So uh, I love Olymp uh, the Olympic area out there in Washington. My My wife, of course, grew up in Renton, right outside of Seattle. So I've gone back there a lot. So um, yeah, GP, you and I both have had a couple hard weeks, huh? Sound and video are great. Thank you, Denny, for that uh, feedback. That's important to know. I had no idea really. And I'll, you know, you keep your fingers crossed when you, uh, when you're on you, when you're on YouTube here. And GP picked up a stunning super red empress. That's an amazing fish. They get very big and bulky, very fast, and they actually can be aggressive, even though they're protomelis and, uh, you know, they eat veggies and, uh, they, you know, they, they can be, uh, they can be a handful. One of the, one of the most aggressive cichlids I've had, believe it or not, was a protomelis, a, um, a fire hap who was absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, but boy, was he a bully and he was big and bulky. So uh, the only one that, that he didn't mess with was my big, my big Venusus, so, uh, who happened to be the tank boss. Hey, Cat Sailor, Naomi H2O is here. Doug M, Shannon King. We've got a good crowd here today. All right, so more folks are jumping on. Let's go ahead and, uh, and do the official launch. What do you say? If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that bell and that sub and, and uh, you know, tell, tell YouTube that you're getting something out of it. And that way they'll recommend it to more fish keepers. It's a win-win, doesn't cost you anything. And like my, my friend IFG likes to say, if you, uh, if you don't like it, you can always unsub. So, and I offer a full, uh, a full refund also. <laughs> so. Um, Stay tuned for uh, the bonus tips at the end of today's video and also a special announcement I'm going to be making. Now, you know how I like to do lists. I always keep lists. Look at this thing. I have two, two pages of stuff that I'd love to, to cover with you. So much information and so little time. And, um, but I want to get into setting up a tank, setting up a new tank, and... Um, or setting up, or or maybe looking at the redoing of an existing tank, which happens. You know, we we get to a point where we, you know, we want to move a tank to a different place in the home, or or move it into a basement that was finally built out, or some other, you know, something of the sort. And we 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 do a redo. We do a a complete redo. And so uh, these kind of things happen. So I have some some basic tips for you, and and some more advanced tips as we go along and um the first the, the first one i have just jumping right into it is you you really need to think through size and location size and location keeping in mind that um what kind of fish do you want to keep i mean if you're if you're going to get into if you if you're intrigued by by haps you know the the larger what some people call the predator cichlids your malawi trouts your um your hawks right your venusus your living stone eye things like this you're gonna need a hundred plus gallons minimum and uh six feet you know six feet of swim space for these open open swimmers open water swimmers 
Mabuna, you know, Mabuna, you could you could go a little more you could go a little more compact w- with a lot of cave work, a lot of stacked cave work, and certainly with something like a community tank, things of that nature, you're going to be able to go even even smaller. But um, extrapolate out, think out where are these fish going to be in six months to two years. Forget about the one inch per gallon rule. That is, uh, that's probably gotten more people in 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 uh, in a jam than anything. It, forget about that. Think how big is this fish going to be? Forget what size he is when you get him, uh, unless you're trying to match their sizes for aggression control things like that. But definitely, where am I going to be in a year? Where am I going to be in two years? Otherwise, you're going to go from like I did. You're going to go from a, a 30 to a 60 to a 120. And, you know, you're just going to have to keep upgrading because uh, if that's the kind of fish you want. Now, if I had been in a community tank, I could have stayed probably at a 60 and been fine. You know, been fine forever when I was back in back in Arcadia, California. Now, <clears throat> so think think through the kind of fish also just on a mechanical on a mechanical basis, what what's the condition of your floor? Now, I've heard that if you have carpet, it's not a bad idea to cut out the section where you're going to be putting the tank and laying out something like a vinyl or a tile or something like that, because inevitably, at some point, you're going to spill, and nothing's worse than a moldy-smelling carpet. So if you have a nice plush padded carpet, you may want to consider cutting out the section where that tank is going to be. Also, can that floor support the weight of the tank you're going to put on it? There are probably not too many floors out there uh, that can't support, let's say, a 60-gallon. I don't think that's going to be a lot of a, a, too much of a challenge. I mean... If you can put a tall bookcase and fill it with books, certainly a 60-gallon is not going to be that much of a challenge, right? You can put a television, some audio equipment, and a lot of books in this cap, you know, and the floor does, yeah, an aquarium is going to be fine. Now you start to get up into the 100 plus, 150, 210, 220, 300. You better take a look at um, at the kind of floor you have. Now, here, one of the things I love about this room that I'm in is I have a concrete, I have a concrete floor. Floor is no longer on my radar as something, as an issue, as a potential issue. It used to be. And I ended up paying the price. When I moved from the place I was leasing in California, I forked out $800 to help repair the wood floor under that 150 gallon because the stand reached all the way to the floor. So there was no way for me to get under it if water ever ever got under the stand. There was no way for me to dry it. Except maybe, I don't know, I guess I could have run hot air or blow dryer, I don't know. But the few times I had spills, especially when I was setting up that sump. (laughs) When I was setting up my sump, I had a few spills until I got an understanding of what I was doing. That created wood damage and swelling, and things of that nature. And so, um, truth is, I got away cheap for $800. It could have been a lot more expensive. So, think in terms of your floor. Do you need to reinforce your floor? Do you need to cut out a piece of carpet? Right? Is the floor going to be able to hold it? Now, uh, on a very basic, uh, also a very basic level, how level is the situation? Floors are not always level. Stands are not always level. So certainly, get your hands on something. It doesn't even have to be this big, but get your hands on something like this. And, uh, and definitely make sure that everything is level or you're going to end up with too much pressure or, or a, a disproportionate amount of pressure on the different on the different uh, vertical seams of your tank, and this could result in in your tank having some issues. 
So really, really work on leveling. Now, for me in this in this fish room, leveling has become a big issue because the room is the the garage, which I appreciate because of the amount of rainfall and you know precipitation we get here. The garage is actually slighted, slanted slightly downward towards the exit. So there's a, a difference of as much as an inch uh, from the, the, the back section of my tank to the front section. So I have to use uh, a product. I have to use either tiles or, um, you know, solid objects to help with, with the tank. But I also use these things here. They're, they're a, um, a shim. You can pick these up anywhere on Amazon, eBay. I even have them at my Amazon channel, which, by the way, I haven't mentioned. If you um, if you do want to uh, get anything on Amazon, go over to Am use Amazon.com slash shop slash Ben Ochart. And if you get something from my store, which has everything from camera equipment to fish equipment. If you, uh, if you get anything there, the channel gets a credit. But if you go somewhere else on Amazon and pick up some cookware or uh, some clothes or some, whatever, the channel gets credit if you went there using that link. So it's kind of a cool program. Not a lot of credit, like, I don't know, 0.01%, but it helps and it adds up. Also, um, you can pick up these shims. These are plastic shims, and uh, it was someone suggested it to me, and it made sense. They will not corrode. They don't. They don't. They don't uh, break down like wood. You know, they don't get rot and soggy, rotten and soggy. So use plastic shims, and I have to use these on every one of the aquariums in this room because of the um, banging my mic here, because of the slant on the floor. So. Um, Pick up some shims if, if, if you need them and consider the plastic composite ones. Those are the better ones. And then also take into consideration sunlight. If it, Where you position that tank. I've seen folks with tanks positioned in front of windows, and I can only imagine what that tank is going to look like. Unless they black out the window, uh, you're going to be overrun with algae. So in the positioning of your tank, you want to have it in a place that's going to be very, you know, limited, limited with light and have the tank getting the amount of light that you want it to get, depending on how long you run your lights. So uh, where are you going to put this tank? Now, remember that your positioning of the tank also has to take into account your access to water. Now, ideally, now this is the way I like doing it. You might like being on the bucket brigade I don't like the bucket brigade. And um, I remember going to work on Monday mornings with a sore back after doing water changes on, uh, on Sunday. So uh, I use a Python system that connects, connects to a faucet. You can get hoses that are, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet. You can get some pretty long hoses. But if you can have your tank set up uh, within a, a proximity of a water source, like a sink that you can then, you know, run a hose to fill and uh, and even drain using that same hose. So what I used to do is I used to use the hose. I would drain the tanks with the python, but not have it hooked up to the faucet. I would take the end of the python outside and water the plants with the tank water, which is very nutritious, by the way. And uh, the higher the nitrates, the better. Well, plants love nitrates, right? So then. I, uh, when I took the tank to the level that I wanted it to be at, then I would go ahead and connect the Python to the faucet, temperature match, right? Treat the tank for the entire volume of the tank. When you fill from the tap, you're supposed to treat for the entire volume of the tank. And, uh, and then I would fill the tank. And uh, that was so much easier than five trips of water, you know, outside and then five trips of water from you know, the bathtub to the tank. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So uh, when positioning your tank, when positioning your tank, be aware of a, a convenient or access to a water source. Also be aware of your electrical needs. Be sure that you have outlets. 
and don't have to be running, you know, a hundred feet of uh, extension cord all over the house, which uh, makes you real popular with the kids and your wife. So, <laughs> so the other thing that is very important to consider when you're setting up a new tank is filtration. And again, let's look at what kind of fish you want to keep, what kind of aquarium you're going to keep. If you're going to have a lightly stocked community tank with a lot of plants, you probably don't need a lot of water turnover. You could probably go in that three to six times per hour window and you'd be okay, maybe even less. If you're going to have cichlids, African cichlids, who produce tremendous amounts of waste and who destroy plants, and so you really can't have live plants in there, and you're going to have it heavily stocked in, in an effort to try and spread out aggression, like so many cichlid keepers do, then you're going to need, you're going to have to be up in that, you know, up in that 10 times an hour of turnover uh, to, to keep things clean and looking good. So you can use that as a sort of a, as a guide. Low stock, high plants, lower turnover. High stock, no plants, higher turnover, right? You can kind of create an inverse graph on that. And um, I, like to, I like to be in that sweet spot of about 10, you know, 10 per. And um, that's where I like to be. But let me go ahead and move this back over. I like to be in that 10 times per gallon. That's just sort of where I feel good with the African cichlids. And even with the, I'll probably end up to some degree that way with the South Americans, only because I'm finding that plants are not doing well with them. The plants that I had on the, uh, on the driftwood, I had some plants attached to the driftwood in this tank. Do you remember when I first set it up? And uh, those plants are now shoved inside of those artificial plants from elite cichlids. I've actually tucked, they, they, they were dislodged by the fish. The fish were pecking at them, dislodged them. They were super glued to the driftwood. The fish dislodged them and I found them floating around. So I tucked them inside of the artificial and they're, they're leaving them alone in the middle of the artificial. So who knows, maybe I'm onto something, a way of being able to fool the fish into having some real, uh, real plants in there. But again, if you're going to be having a heavily stocked tank with no plants, consider a lot of turnover. Now, how are you going to achieve that turnover? I like to achieve it with uh, a redundancy of filtration. In the case of the tanks behind me, I have a, uh, both a, a powerhead type sponge filter from Expertmatic, and I have the uh, Marineland the Marine Land Bio Wheel Emper 400s. So I have two types of filtration going on both those tanks. While I service one, the other one runs, and then a couple of weeks later, I'll service the other. So there's, there's a rotation that goes on, and it helps to minimize the shock on the tank. So um, filtration is going to be an important uh, consideration. And again, that depends on your objective. So we did a survey. We did a survey at the, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. We did a survey over at, at the YouTube community page. And I asked you folks, what, what did you think was important? And um, just about everything I've said so far aligns and we had almost a thousand votes, almost a thousand votes. That's a pretty good sampling. That's a pretty good sampling. And uh, research at forty-five percent came out on top. So that everything I've talked about so far could conceivably fall under the umbrella of of research. Where am I going to put my tank? Uh, what's the filtration requirements? Uh, what lighting do I want? Is my floor going to handle it? What do I do to level things? 
and uh, what type of fish do I want to keep and how does that impact the amount of filtration I'm going to need, the amount of water turnover. All of that is, is some, is some front end research that in an ideal world we would do, but let, let's be honest. How do people get into fish keeping? A friend says, Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be keeping my tank anymore. Do you want it? Uh, they, they happen to, to go into Petco and they're having a sale. They go, Oh, okay. Yeah. Give me a tank and give me a dozen of those neon tetras. Those are pretty. And, uh, and away you go. So, uh, research I find is occurring in the, in the fish keeping community. Research is usually occurring after the fact. In other words, the person gets the tank home and all, all the neons die and they either give up or they start to research and say, okay, let me figure out what happened. And I, I've gone through that same process. You know, I'm going through it now. I mean, it's, it's, it's research. It's, you, you do something and you think you got it. It doesn't work right. And you, you, you step back and you go, okay, what's, what could have been done differently? What did I learn? What's my takeaway? Like on that whole situation with, with Verdi and, and, and Sal, uh, the uh, Aran Som, Green Terror, and, and the Salvini. Well, if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're putting a fish in quarantine and you, then you, you happen to add another fish, which happens sometimes, you, know, you, you just extend the quarantine time. But when that happens, it's probably a good idea to, to medicate, to use like that trio, that medication trio that Corey talks about, uh, do some do some parasite treatment and uh, things of that nature. So always learning. So another thing to consider when you're considering filtration, if you're going to be um, if you're going to be Using hang on back filters. I've got a little mini one here. I'll show. Little baby hang on back. Cutest thing ever. Right? This is a hang on back filter with a sponge pre filter. And uh, if you're going to be using a hang on back filter, keep in mind that that's going to that's going to extend the amount of space that you're going to need between the wall and your tank. So your tank is going to extend out. So if you cut your carpet and you cut it just right and you laid some tile and you did this sort of, and then you decide to go with hang on back filters. And so your tank is going to be hanging off into the carpet anyway. So um, really got to think that through. If you're going to be using some big hang on back filters, aqua clears or whatever, those big ones out there, um, you're going to need that space. You're going to need that space. And, um, uh, by the way, I do recommend pre-filters. I've had a lot of luck with them. They really uh, extend the time between filter cleaning and they pick up the big particles. And what I really like about them is that food, food, rather than getting sucked into the filter and then just rotting in the filter, food sticks to the, to the uh, pre-filter and then the fish come along and just peck it off. Or if you have plecos, you know, they come along and they kind of work the sponge. So. Uh, Highly recommend it. Maybe if you don't, if you want to keep your tank tucked up against the wall, maybe a sponge filter. Maybe that's the best thing for you. And these come, of course, this is a mini one, but they come in big, big types of filters too, right? And uh, that the advantage of that, of course, is that you can be right up against the wall. You might also consider a sump if you're into a larger setup, 100 gallon plus. A sump is a good idea. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind with a sump is that very often people who run sumps, not sumps that are built into the back of the tank, but the sumps that are actually a tank that's under the tank, right? Uh, there, there's usually a little bit of, of space at the top of the tank in the event that the overflow, uh, whether it's an overflow box or, or a you know, however you're, you're getting water down to the sump, if that were to, for some reason, become blocked 
and the pump in the sump continued to pump water up to the tank, you wouldn't want the tank to just overflow everywhere. So they usually leave a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of space at the top. And this is why if you watched my visit, my video, my trip to glass cages, very often they'll put a black strip along the top of these larger tanks, or they'll use a slightly larger frame because uh, that hides the water line. It gives you a, a hidden water line. With the tank that I'm, that I'm doing right now, the 90 gallon uh, rimless that I finally was able to get up on the stand, that tank, as much as I was leaning towards going with a sump, because it's a rimless, and I'm not sure what I'm gonna put on top of it, I'm definitely not gonna put a canopy. See, a canopy will drop down a couple inches and that'll give you your water line fudge, fudge area, right? Because the, the, the hood, the canopy will cover that empty space. So I want to have this rimless filled to the top. So I'm probably going to end up with hang on back filters, possibly two hang on back filters. Don't, I'm not sure I want to put the, uh, I don't think I want to put the expert Maddox in there only because they're, they're not going to be like with the theme of the tank. So, but having a couple intakes from maybe a couple marine lands, that could work. That could work. And uh, it might give me the amount of turnover I need. I also have an FX6 I can use. So that might be also an option. And with an FX6, the only distance you need behind the tank is enough room to be able to mess with the hoses, right? To connect the hoses and things like that. Connecting an FX6 hooking the FX6 hoses onto a rimless tank, that'll be an interesting situation. I may have to use some type of some type of an adapter that I can then attach onto. We'll see. The glass is like an inch and a half thick. I mean, it's really thick glass, so it might be able to, to hook on there. So um, just things to consider, and also media. I mean, what kind of media do you want to use? Do you want to go high-end? You want to go high end, look into Marine Pure, look into Bio Home Ultimate, look into things like that, right? Matrix. Those are your high end medias that you can put into your filters. Or you can use scrubbers, you know, little, little pot scrubbers. Just make sure they don't have any soap or anything in them. Just plain basic plastic pot scrubbers. You can use just sponges. And um, what I'm going to be doing with, with this 90 gallon is I'm going to be putting, as you probably guess, I'm going to be using three inches, three inches of substrate. So the substrate is going to be the home of beneficial bacteria. And I'm going to be using primarily uh, sponges in the filtration. Even if it's of an, an FX6, it's probably going to be all sponges. Sponges work great. They work both as mechanical and they work as, as, uh, they work as a great home for beneficial bacteria too. So in some ways, sponges might, might be the ideal, the ideal media when you consider cost, when you consider longevity. How long do these sponges last? I mean, I had sponges last four or five years before they'd show any, deterior, any, any signs of deteriorizing. So uh, now, another point, another point to consider. What kind of substrate do you want to use? Do you want something? Um, that buffers, you have like a, I was watching a video by Corey the other day, apparently where he's at, the water is about six, 6.5. He wants, he wants the, the pH to be higher. So he, in this particular video, he was in love with coral, crushed coral. Uh, it buffers, it adds minerals, it adds calcium and other elements to the water. Uh, you know, it hardens your water a bit. And so he really loved crushed coral. I used to use crushed coral exclusively back in Arcadia and back in California, and I had great results with it. The, uh, you can also use aragonite. What's in this tank right here is aragonite. And that is for buffering, for uh, you know, adding minerals to the water. And um, so aragonite also is very, very effective. The, uh, or do you just want to go with something that's inert, that does nothing to the water, 
and like a plain sand or plain gravel, uh, that type of thing. I, I like sand. That's what I've recently gone into and have enjoyed it. But the other thing that, that became very apparent to me, especially recently, is that if you're using a light-colored sand, a light-colored sand, you're going to show every piece of detritus, as is the case in this tank here. And with the lighter colored fish, you're going to be washing them out. You're going to be washing out their colors. Their colors are impacted quite a bit by the substrate. More, in my experience, by the substrate than by the background. The background of these tanks is black. I love the way a black background makes the fish pop. However, this, this white substrate, which, you know, my, geo, my geos, you can see the geos, and uh, backwards here, the geos, and the hecli, and, you know, they're all, they're all kind of, I mean, they're all beautiful, but they're all, but they're, but they're a bit washed out. And so I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I have this, this substrate called lapis luster given to me by John here in Nashville, just a friend of mine here in Nashville. And I'm going to be mixing some black imaginarium, which is just a black sand substrate that I used to have back in California. People used to love that, that substrate. I'm going to be mixing uh, 40 pounds of black imaginarium from Petco. I'm going to be mixing that in with the lapis luster to, to give it a, a darker, just a darker overall color. And I think that when I move these South Americans over to the 90, it's going to uh, bring out more of their colors in, their, in them. Uh, I was talking to uh, James, James Largo, uh, over at the Cichlid Shack in Arizona, which, uh, by the way, as you probably know, the Cichlid Shack is a sponsor of the channel. And uh, if you go to the shack, be sure to use Shack Attack 10, and you'll get a 10% discount at checkout. And uh, that fish on, uh, on the Shack Attack logo is, uh, is a phoenix. I've got a phoenix in the tank behind me. That fish is full of attitude. What a beautiful fish. So I was talking to, John, I was, I was talking to James, and, uh, and he was telling me that fish that were in the same batch of some of the fish he provided to me were already showing much more color, such as the red shoulder severums and the viejas. They were showing much more color than what he was seeing in my fish. And it became obvious that the white substrate was uh, washing those fish out. So um, really take into consideration. I mean, I imagine if you're going to be going with a lot of very, very dark fish, a little bit of, of light, sub, maybe a light substrate is not going to be that big a deal. But if you have fish that, that are light, sort of translucent, lighter in color, uh, the white substrate can very much wash them out. And and I guess maybe this is a good thing. The, uh, that substrate will keep you on your toes with your cleaning and maintenance because uh, every little bit of poop and detritus shows up immediately and, uh, and will just be there relentlessly until you clean it. <laughs> so when setting up a new tank, the other thing I, I suggest is this. Have on hand, go ahead and, and have on hand immediately some meds. Because when you're setting up a new tank, stuff can happen. Probably the most common thing that happens is ick. Whether it's because you imported some ick or you stress the fish in moving them or the tank is creating a little bit of stress. There's maybe some trace amounts of ammonia, trace amounts of nitrite. So in my case, I like to keep a batch of, uh, of this cordon ick attack. Just happens to be my ick medicine of choice. It's worked very well for me. What you use ultimately 
what you use, of course, is up to you. Do your research. You have to consider the type of fish you're keeping. Ick attack is very gentle. So even with scaleless fish, you know, loaches, things like that, it's it's safe. Uh, some some are not, you know, so just do some research. Uh, maybe also keep some salt. This is some uh, salt from Fritz. A little salt, you know, something doesn't seem right. A tablespoon for every five gallons, you know, this kind of helps get slime coat going, uh, gets them, uh, gets constipation uh, worked out. You know, have a few basic things. Maybe some general cure, maybe some API general cure or some Furon 2, things like that. Have some meds. Don't wait for something to happen and then be running out or you notice it after the local stores are closed and you know you're you're giving that that disease time to 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 get a better hold of your fish. So definitely have have some med meds on hand. Another thing we should talk about is lighting. There's a lot of lighting you can get, a lot of lighting out there. Personally, I I over the years I've I've come to like the most the um LEDs. The LED full spectrum lighting. Now, when you hear the word full spectrum, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. Is that going to promote algae growth? Is that going to promote, um, perhaps, perhaps it is. Uh, I don't use my lights that long during the day. They're on a timer, a very simple, inexpensive timer that I plug them into. I run them for a few hours in the morning and several hours at night. And um, But I think full spectrum is going to show you the full color of the fish because it's the closest to sunshine. And uh, I love the, the, the real slim profile of LED lights. You can see one here. This is a, a light from, from uh, my friends over at Hyger. Is that how you pronounce it? Hyger? Look at the profile on that thing. Super thin profile, brushed aluminum, and it has blues, reds, greens, and white lights. Does a great job. And this light will probably go on the 90. It'll have no problem whatsoever lighting the entire tank all the way to the bottom. Some people like to have uh, shady spots in their tanks. They, um, they like the, uh, the fish having perhaps a darker area to hang out in. Some fish like that. Just things to consider, and again, part of that research step. Another bonus tip I'll give you is don't start off with bad nutrition. If you're setting up a tank, start off with good nutrition. And what I do, this is a, this is a new life spectrum container, but it doesn't have new life spectrum in it. <laughs> It's not a knock on New Life Spectrum. I think they're doing the best they can. But I, uh, what I have in here is I have Hycine Energetics. I have uh, Extreme. And I have Northfin. And I think like I'm forgetting something else. But this is a combination of food. And for me... Over the years, I, I, it's just been my philosophy that no one food company has it all figured out. And a lot of them are, I'm, and this is not a knock on any of them, including New Life Spectrum. I mean, they're, they're trying their best. They're trying to figure it out. But I don't think any one of them has it all figured out. And I do think that economics come into play. What, what can they get their hands on? What's available to them? Uh, and, you know, what's a good price? that they can get it at, you know, they're, they're getting, you know, except maybe for Piscine. Piscine, you know, they farm their own ingredients, right? They, 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 they pull those, those little, those little shrimp out, you know, and they, they have a special process they use on them. So Piscine probably controls the entire process more complete than anybody. But, um, I like to cover all my bases. And because of that, I use a combination of foods. I will also supplement the uh, with uh, frozen krill with with 
the haps with the you know the the, the bigger cichlids frozen krill with the with the um, you know with south americans i could use bloodworms i also love the omega cichlid cubes which contain garlic i think those are great so um, supplement those fish with good nutrition don't go with the least expensive um, color enhancement i mean you see color enhancement additives I don't know. I guess they're okay, but I, I don't. I think that if you're feeding them good nutrition and they're healthy and the water's good, you're going to get good color. That's just my two cents. Now, what about heating the tank? We haven't talked about heaters. If you are keeping your tanks in a room that you're going to control the temperature of the room and you don't mind sitting in 79 degrees, that's okay. I guess you're okay. You don't need heaters. If you do need a heater, uh, my rule of thumb has been, especially after moving to an area where it can get cold, five watts per gallon. So you have a 100-gallon tank, right? 500 watts a heater. I also feel it's very important that you use a controller only because over the years I've heard so many horror stories about heater malfunctions. So what a controller does, and a lot of you out there are familiar with them. Look at this beast. This beast takes the place of the thermostat. <laughs> this is doing what the thermostat in your heater is supposed to be doing. Uh, this one is from Jemco. J-E-H-M-C-O. It's not cheap. This is about a hundred bucks. It's got two sockets. I can put two heaters into it. And uh, if you want to use a couple of heaters in a bigger tank for better, uh, better heat disbursement. And it's just super heavy duty. Look at the cord on that thing. So what happens is the sensor. The sensor sits in your tank. And the sensor determines what the temperature of your tank is. And if your tank reaches the target temperature, the electricity to your heater is cut off. As you know, I recently had an incident with a cobalt heater. I think they're called Ecotherm. Expensive heater. It was the second one that had malfunctioned on me. If, if, if I didn't have a controller to shut the first time it happened, if I didn't have a controller on that tank, right? If I wasn't using controllers, I would not have been able to heat the tank. So um, I highly recommend controllers. I think you should have them. Uh, heaters malfunction. What happens, I think, is the thermostats. I think they, they, they sometimes they fuse shut. They, they close, and when they close, then they don't unstick. They just keep heating and heating and heating. And so, at any rate, that's my two cents. Five watts per gallon, and, and consider a controller. It doesn't have to be an expensive one. You can get an Inkbird. You can get an Inkbird. I have those listed at my Amazon channel, at my Amazon store. You get an Inkbird for like 30 bucks, right? 30, 35 bucks. Now, when setting up your tank, what about your background? What about the background of your tank? Some people like to spray paint it. I've done that. Look good. If you change your mind, you're going to have a lot of work. I spray painted the back, and then I ended, I ended up getting a 3D background from Universal. So it didn't matter that I spray painted it because that universal background went inside the tank. But if I'd wanted to go with another outside type of arrangement, I would have had, I would have had a lot of scraping to do. So I, I personally don't spray paint the tanks anymore. Instead, I use these, uh, a material that was covered in one of my videos. And it's by a company called Velamax. And Velamax 
is it's real easy, real easy to apply. You just you just got to really make sure make sure the back of the tank is really clean, super clean. And any areas that that you have any question about, you just scrape with a with a razor, right? You just get a little razor and scrape it, and and uh, and you just clean it and clean it and clean it until it's perfect. And then you spray it with water, and then you just you just get this and make sure that it's clean, and you peel it apart, you spray it with water, and you just attach it to the tank leaving a little extra all the way around that you can then trim off with a razor blade. And you end up with this nice black back, you know, this nice black background, as you can see in the tanks behind me. So this is very easy to work with. Now, let's say down the road, I want to go with a different color. I want to go with a blue, or I want to go with nothing. This stuff just peels right off. You grab a corner, it's off, over, done. And a uh, little easier than uh, spray paint. The Universal Rocks uh, background that I had, I thought was awesome. After it aged and, and got some algae and a little wear on it, it looked better. It looked more natural. Uh, the, right, the older it got and the more algae and what have you. However, uh, I did find that I did get an accumulation of waste and detritus between the background and the back of the tank. And those fish were very healthy. They were very hardy. So in the total scheme of things, I'm not sure if that was having a very big impact. Maybe if I had had fish that were more sensitive, like discus or something like that, that might have made an impact having that waste back there. I've also uh, read theories about how things like Colomeris will um, breed and grow on waste. You know, that's that's where it it it, it kind of serves as a as a home to promote Colomeris. So I moved away from uh, from the three D backgrounds. Doesn't mean they're all bad. You can always pull them back if you don't mind the extra work. You, you can pull them away from the back and simply vacuum down there. And if you did that probably once every three, four months, you'd be in good shape. So um, I think I've pretty much given you at least 10 tips, uh, maybe, maybe a couple extra. And... Uh, let me check on what, what you have to say here. I'm going to jump into the, into, the, uh, into the chat here. If I've missed a super chat, I want to thank you for doing that. I was just rambling on and on and, and, and not looking at what was going on. Anthony DeStefano, 499. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Perfect topic. I just purchased a 75-gallon upgrade from 30-gallon. For my six dudes. <laughs> You've got the dudes. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad. All right. Let's see here. John Wallace. Hey, John. Thank you, my friend. I'm glad you think so. All right, I'm just going through. If you have any questions, go ahead and add them to the chat now. Philium, Philium Gunam, Philium Gunam. Am I pronouncing that right or am I butchering it? Five euro towards your new discus aquarium. <laughs> someday, my friend, someday. As it is, I'm trying to get through this 90-gallon project, and then I have a 210 uh, that I have secured along with a stand from um, glass cages, and that's probably where the cichlids are going to go. And I'm going to be adding some of the larger uh, haps at that point and see how they get along with these guys. And also reintroducing the Eureka Red back into the cichlid mix. Eureka Red is gorgeous. Uh, living alone, he's just really blossoming. But I'm going to throw some hawks in there and uh, some trouts and some other stuff and see how that, see how that goes. So, 
So let's see here. About 100 tips. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> All right. 100 tips. No extra charge for the extra 90 tips on today's uh, video. And uh, now I, I, I told you, uh, uh, Brian, no. Brian, I have never attempted to make my own background. And uh, I wish I was that handy. I've seen some people make them. They're beautiful. Using styrofoam or they... They've poured uh, concrete. They've done all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, anyway, I wish I was that handy. The, um, you know, Michael, I, I, when I had that Universal Rocks background, it was called the Rocky Thin. It was about a half an inch, and it just simply popped into place and, and stood there. So the, the clips were kind of meaningless. It just sort of stood in place. I, uh, I had a lot of substrate at the bottom of it helping to hold it in place, but it never slouched really. It was very hard. I had to cut it actually. When I went from a, from a standard 125 to a 150, I had to reduce its height. I had, I, I, I had a six, it was six feet across, but it was way deeper. The 150 was, was way deeper. And that's how I got the extra gallons, but I had to take four inches off the, like three or four inches off the top of the universal and man, that thing was hard to cut. That thing was like, it was just really, it was like, it was like trying to cut a uh, saddle, like a saddle leather, you know? It was like, <laughs> took me like a whole morning. Anyway, aqua decor uh, is also very, very beautiful. Scott, you bring up aqua decor. Uh, those are uh, beautiful, but uh, very expensive. You're going to pay a lot of money. They're going to be shipped from Europe, and, uh, but they're beautiful. I don't like, backgrounds that are too much because they take away swim space from the fish and that's what the tank's all about i mean the tank is the home of the fish so i don't want them to to lose four or five inches on the back of the tank because i want it to look like you know like the edge of a of a, of a lake or something so you know it, anyway that's my thought on that and uh, if you have any comments, go ahead and add them now. I'll be happy to take them up. And thank you to my super chatters. Very kind of you, and I hope I didn't miss any. If I did, I will try and scan back and pick them up. And your super chats help. And that reminds me, I promised you an announcement. And uh, the announcement is, uh, drum roll. I am going to be at Aquashello. I'm not going to be uh, speaking or presenting or doing anything like that. I'm going to be wandering around just like a lot of you. And uh, maybe I'll, 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 uh, I'll set things up so I can meet, meet you at one of the uh, booths or something. Like, you know, meet me at the CSA booth at 1 o'clock or something. But if you want to meet... Maybe I'll talk to uh, Jay Wilson about that. But um, I'm going to be there. I, I come in Friday. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with uh, my friend Joe from Glass Cages and uh, probably stopping by to see uh, John and Lisa give a talk. I'll probably drop in on Zenzo Tozawa's talk and uh, otherwise just kind of wandering around and, uh, and uh, picking up a bunch of freebies like everybody else. <laughs> But I am going to be at Aquashella. I hope that if you are going to be there, that you look me up and, uh, you know, send me uh, an email if you're going to be there. And uh, I'll coordinate and let you know where I, where I am. Maybe I can set up one spot to be at at some point and I can meet some of you in person and I can put some faces, faces with the names. And uh, my wife took a look at our, uh, at our Southwest Southwest account and discovered that we had some unused, unused tickets, unused miles. And so I was able to get in within the budget. One of you was kind enough to offer your home to me as a guest. That was very sweet of you. You know who you are. And, um, anyway, that, that was very appreciated and I certainly was considering it, but we were able to get it within the budget and I'm looking forward to being there. So um, 
Elijah Davis, some Aquashella money. <laughs> Thank you, Elijah. As I said, Elijah is a great supporter of the channel. Thank you so much for that. And uh, let's see what else you have to say here. Since I'm showing, since I'm showing your comments on the screen, uh, keep it decent. So. Uh, Yeah, you know, J-Dub, uh, no real com big complaints about Universal. I mean, like I said, my fish were always, were for the most part, they were always healthy. Uh, I really didn't uh, become that aware of how much was building up behind it until I went to, uh, to pull it out and cut it for a, uh, a new tank I was getting. And I realized, my goodness, there's, there's about two inches of just decomposed stuff back here. So... Um, Maybe if there was a way to seal it off, certainly getting a hose down there and vacuuming it every few months probably would be the best, best way to do it. And uh, so, um, yeah, I'm going to be at, at Aquashella both. Sa I'm going to be um, wandering in Saturday morning and, uh, and then spending all day there and then all day Sunday and then taking a late flight out on Sunday. And, uh, Looking forward to it. I just love seeing what's what's happening in the industry and also stopping by some of the booths of the uh, products that I really enjoy and like. Getting to meet some of their representatives, that's always a lot of fun. And um, at any rate. So any questions? Any questions before we wrap up? And anything that I missed in the setting up of a new tank, be sure to add it to the uh, comments after the video posts. Uh, I jammed I jam packed this with so much information, and it was really inspired by uh, by the fact that I'm setting up a new tank, and I and and I've had to level it, I've had to uh, I'm 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 having to roll around in my mind the different ways of filtering it, how I'm going to be mixing the substrate to get a a darker texture to bring up better color in the fish, uh, you know all these different things are going through my head. So very often when I produce, when I put out a video, it, it helps me as much as it helps you because it helps me to get my thought process sorted out and worked out. And uh, you know how that goes. If any of you have ever taught a class, you realize how much you learn about the subject that you're teaching while you're teaching it. So, <laughs> so at any rate, that's it for me, my friends. And I will see you this coming Saturday. Thank you to my wonderful uh, moderators. Thank you to all of you for your support, especially over the last week, which was a little tough. And uh, I think that's all for me. And I hope to see you next week for Cichlids and Coffee. And uh, same time. And I think, I don't know if I'll do a live Cichlids and Coffee from Aquashella. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe I'll do a live one from there. So. At any rate, thank you, everybody. Uh, you uh, don't ever forget. You rock. You really do. Bye-bye.